Thank you and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this special edition of the 700 Club. On today's program, we'll talk with the late Francis Schaeffer. The interview is from 1982, but the wisdom is timeless as Dr. Schaefer addresses the issue of secular humanism and its impact on our schools, our society, the church, and the individual. You don't want to miss it. But before we get to that interview, let me remind you, we have telephones all during the program where you can call if you need help. Now, Francis Schaefer. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about humanism, and people aren't quite sure. Of course, they, they think the word humanitarian, that sounds so wonderful, and uh, the humanities are taught in school, and there are various other definitions. Could you make some distinctions between all of these various terms? Yes, I think that it's very important that we really make the distinctions. Otherwise, first of all, we don't know what we're talking about, but second, uh, we set ourselves up to be shot down, and quite properly unless we make the distinctions. Humanitarianism means that we're kind to humanity, and surely then Christians ought to be the most humanitarian people in all the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the humanities are, uh, would be a study of uh, human creativity, mm -hmm. what uh, the human creativity has produced. Now, sometimes Christians has, have looked on this sort of uh, negatively, or at least neutrally, but we should be the people of all people who should be interested in the humanities mm -hmm. because creativity comes from being made in the image of God as the great creator, and consequently of all people, we ought to be uh, interested in the humanities. And so on this basis, the Calvin, for example, or Milton have sometimes been called Christian humanists. Mm -hmm. But that's an old use of the term. Uh, but we have to understand we're not against the humanities. We are for them. But humanism, in contrast to that, is quite opposite. Humanism is putting man at the center of all things, and the only knowledge that man can have is what finite human beings can find out for themselves, and absolutely ruled out dogmatically mm -hmm. uh, the possibility of any knowledge from God. And it also means that man is the center of all things in creating all value systems, all the meaning to life, and all the basis for law. Well, now, when they publish a manifesto, a manifesto is normally a militant document. The Communist Manifesto was a militant document, and they have published two humanist manifestos. Now, is, is that a militant position that they want to advance to all society? Absolutely. Just as we said yesterday, uh, there is no mixture between these two concepts of final reality, uh, either material or energy shaped by chance, mm -hmm. or, or a personal, infinite, personal God. Uh, now, there can be no mixture, but they really believe that, reali that that's all reality is. And they're out to take their view and put it across. And the thing that should make us ashamed as Christians is that they understood that they were two worldviews that had no mixture, mm -hmm. not only intellectually, but they were going to produce absolutely different uh, results in every area of life, and we ought to be ashamed that they understood it before we did. <laughs> well, let me ask you, do you think that uh, Christianity is dominant? Are they dominant? Who's, who's winning in America? They've obviously won in Europe already. Well, what about here in this country? I would say we're an awful long way down the road. Mm -hmm. Where we are, we must realize that uh, the up to, say, 80 years ago, uh, there was an absolute Christian consensus in this country. This country was founded on a Christian consensus, a Judeo-Christian position, especially as it came out of the Reformation, and this was the dominant view. But beginning about 80 years ago, it began to shift. And then all the titanic changes have come in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. So within the time of our own lifetime, the changes come. Today, we live in a human society. They control the schools, mm -hmm. they control public television, the control of the media in general. And what we have to say is we live in a humanist uh, society. But we're moving very, very rapidly toward a totally humanist society. And if we don't hurry up and do something, uh, we're really in trouble. Well, let's go. The, one of the things that I hear so often is the question of separation of church and state. They say, well, we're supposed to separate church and state, separate church and state, and uh, uh, the humanists don't mean by that what our founding fathers, of course, they didn't use that in the Constitution, but the, but the thinking of today is, is vastly different from what our founders, founding fathers thought. Absolutely contrary to it. The First Amendment only meant two things and nothing else, and that is that they would not have a national church. 
mm -hmm. uh, like the Church of England or the Church of Sweden. The church, they, were, they were opposed to the concept of a church for the 13 colonies. The second thing is, now listen, because it's exactly contrary to what's being made, the, church, the, the state would not interfere with religion. Now, that's all the First Amendment meant. Mm -hmm. And today it's been turned over and made the absolute opposite, so that what is now is uh, that the state is interfering with religion in the very opposite thing. And mm -hmm. if now, notice I'm saying religion, all not right. Christianity, that religion now is ruled out of any real impact in our, uh, uh, in our thinking. And the craziness of this shows itself uh, that from the very first, they had somebody pray in Congress. Congress isn't open until it's That's open correct. with prayer. That's correct. So they still can keep doing it. Mm -hmm. But you can't pray in public schools. Yes. How schizophrenic can you get? Well, it's the same thing with the Supreme Court, which says, God bless this noble court. I mean, it starts out that way, and yet they deny the privilege to little children to do what they do and, and to, pro to post the Ten Commandments, which they have on the walls of their court. And I would want to say with all finality that if the Founding Fathers could come back and see what's being made of that First Amendment, mm -hmm. they would consider it nothing less than tyranny. Well, let's go back to the concept of law. The, the, uh, if you have a Christian state, what is law? If you have a humanist state, what is law? Well, if you have a, a Christian state, or uh, let's not say a Christian state, but uh, a state that's founded on a Christian consensus. Mm -hmm. If you have this, you have a basis for law. And you must remember that what we have out of the Northern European culture of form and freedom, uh, of balances in government, these things are absolutely unique in the world. They were unique in history. Sometimes people say the Greek city-states have them. No real scholar believes this. What, what the Reformation produced was absolutely unique, in which there was real form, with, and yet the Christian consensus mm -hmm. kept that uh, kept the freedoms from pounding uh, the society to pieces because there's a law to base things on. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you come in from the humanist side, uh, man is the measure of all things and there's nothing to found it on. So that it's very interesting that these people move from denying the building of law upon the word of God mm -hmm. to denying any strict construction from the Constitution. They're absolutely, uh, they're, he they're absolutely, uh, free to make law what they want it to be. So, so the concept of, of law as existing apart, in a sense, from man, but coming from God and being a discovery of revelation of God, that's where we started. The, the, the idea of, of, of law is king, Lex Rex, that that, that is, the, is, the, is, the, is the king. And now we're substituting men's views, sociological interpretation for law. We switched it right over. Yeah. Uh, Samuel Rutherford, who means a great deal to me, uh, it wrote his, uh, wrote his uh, Lex Rex, law is king. And what he was saying is the king is not law. Mm -hmm. Now, what we've turned it is we flipped it right over from Oliver Wendell Holmes, all these people are brought in sociological law, mm -hmm. uh, which means that law is made on what a few people think is for the sociological good of the, of the mm -hmm. uh, community at the moment. Uh, we flipped it right over, and now what we're returning to, people don't think of it this way, is Rex Lex, king is law. The only thing is we don't have a king. What we have is a Supreme Court, or we have 51% vote, or we have what uh, some the technocrats come forward and tell us uh, is for the good of society. So what we've done is flipped it right over uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, from Lex, Rex, Rex, now Rex, Lex. Well, you think the Supreme Court is, is the vehicle that the humanists are using or the court system to effectuate a radical change in society? Well, government as a whole, but especially the courts, and the, there's a reason for this. All the humanists and the, this type of thinker have used the courts rather than the legislatures mm -hmm. for the simple reason the courts are not subject to the will of the people through election or re-election. Consequently, all the great changes in the four, last 40 years has come through the, uh, through the courts. And what we must get in our mind is the government as a whole, but especially the courts, has become the vehicle mm -hmm. to force this view on the total population, even if the total population doesn't, doesn't hold the view. We have a right to revolt against that. We're going to talk about that later in these discussions. But there comes a time that you have a, revolt, a right to revolt against tyranny, don't you? If you don't uh, revolt against tyranny, and the, this is what I call the bottom line, mm -hmm. 
is that not only do you have the privilege, but the duty to revolt when people force upon you and society that which is absolutely contrary to the word of God mm -hmm. and which really is tyranny. So Samuel Rutherford was an amazing fellow, and what he pointed out quite properly is that God is never the author of tyranny. Therefore, wherever tyranny arises, we have a right to stand against it as a matter of principle. And this was the basis upon which the Founding Fathers built this country. Why is it that nobody sticks up for what they believe anymore? How come people can't accept me the way I am? Why are so many kids today committing suicide? I work hard. I've got two jobs. So why can't I make ends meet? How come meet? Mom and Dad are always fighting? But how can I forgive this drunk driver who ran over me? Why my do I girl? feel like I'm on the outside looking in? For answers that hit home, watch the new 700 Club starting Monday, August 31st. In January 1986, I called the 700 Club counselor and asked for prayer because I was addicted to alcohol. I'll never forget the love and compassion in her voice as she prayed that I would be set free. And praise the Lord, I was. It's been over a year since I've had a drink. And the Lord also healed my back, which had bothered me for years. For so long, my life was like a nightmare. Now it's like a dream. I belong to the 700 Club because I want to be sure that those counselors are there when someone else needs them. When you become a member of the 700 Club, your pledge of $15 a month helps us meet the physical and spiritual needs of millions of people. People just like Bill. Go on now, become a member of the 700 Club, and join a mighty army working to change the world through Jesus Christ. Call now. Become a member and receive a dynamic two-hour tape series from Pat Robertson on Knowing the Will of God. Has our society been undergoing a subtle and perhaps radical shift from its early moorings? Is there something taking place in our schools, in our society, in our courts, in our government in general that would take us along the road of humanism which denies the existence of God and away from the Judeo-Christian traditions that we've had for so long? And we've been talking with noted Christian philosopher and author and scholar, Dr. Francis Schaeffer, about humanism and its impact on American society and what you might do about it. First of all, you have to understand the roots of what's going on and then how you can meet this uh, challenge. And once again, would you please welcome to the 700 Club from La Brie Fellowship in Switzerland, Dr. Francis Schaefer. And we can have this week of chats together. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about humanism, and people aren't quite sure. Of course, they, they think the word humanitarian, that sounds so wonderful, and uh, the humanities are taught in school, and there are various other definitions. Could you make some distinctions between all of these various terms? Yes, I think that it's very important that we really make the distinctions. Otherwise, first of all, we don't know what we're talking about, but second, uh, we set ourselves up to be shot down. And quite properly, unless we make the distinctions. Humanitarianism means that we're kind to humanity, and surely then Christians ought to be the most humanitarian people in all the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the humanities are, uh, would be a study of uh, human creativity, mm -hmm. what uh, the human creativity has produced. Now, sometimes Christians has, have looked on this sort of uh, negatively, or at least neutrally, but we should be the people of all people who should be interested in the humanities mm -hmm. because creativity comes from being made in the image of God as the great creator, and consequently of all people, we ought to be uh, interested in the humanities. And so on this basis, the Calvin, for example, or Milton have sometimes been called Christian humanists. Mm -hmm. But that's an old use of the term. Uh, but we have to understand we're not against the humanities, we are for them. But humanism, in contrast to that, is quite opposite. Humanism is putting man at the center of all things, and the only knowledge that man can have is what finite human beings can find out for themselves. And absolutely ruled out, dogmatically, uh, the possibility of any knowledge from God. And it also means that man is the center of all things in creating all value systems, all the meaning to life, and all the basis for law.
Well, now, when they publish a manifesto, a manifesto is normally a militant document. The Communist Manifesto was a militant document, and they have published two humanist manifestos. Now, is, is that a militant position that they want to advance to all society? Absolutely. Just as we said yesterday, uh, there is no mixture between these two concepts of final reality, uh, either material or energy shaped by chance, mm -hmm. or, or a personal, infinite, personal God. Uh, now, there can be no mixture, but they really believe that, reality, that that's all reality is. And they're out to take their view and put it across. And the thing that should make us ashamed as Christians is that they understood that they were two worldviews that had no mixture, not only intellectually, but they were going to produce absolutely different uh, results in every area of life. And we ought to be ashamed that they understood it before we did. <laughs> well, let me ask you, do you think that uh, Christianity is dominant? Are they dominant? Who's, who's winning in America? They've obviously won in Europe already. Well, what about here in this country? I would say we're an awful long way down the road. Mm -hmm. Where we are, we must realize that uh, the up to, say, 80 years ago, uh, there was an absolute Christian consensus in this country. This country was founded on a Christian consensus, a Judeo-Christian position, especially as it came out of the Reformation. And this was the dominant view. But beginning about 80 years ago, it began to shift. And then all the titanic changes have come in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. So within the time of our own lifetime, the changes come. Today, we live in a human society. They control the schools. They control public television. They control the media in general. And what we have to say is we live in a humanist uh, society. But we're moving very, very rapidly toward a totally humanist society. And if we don't hurry up and do something, uh, we're really in trouble. Well, let's go. The, one of the things that I hear so often is the question of separation of church and state. They say, well, we're supposed to separate church and state, separate church and state. And uh, uh, the humanists don't mean by that what our founding fathers, of course, they didn't use that in the Constitution, but the, but the thinking of today is, is vastly different from what our founders, founding fathers thought. Absolutely contrary to it. The First Amendment only meant two things and nothing else, and that is that they would not have a national church. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Church of England or the Church of Sweden. The church, they, were, they were opposed to the concept of a church for the 13 colonies. The second thing is, now listen, because it's exactly contrary to what's being made, the, church, the, the state would not interfere with religion. Now that's all the First Amendment meant. Mm -hmm. And today it's been turned over and made the absolute opposite. So that what is now is uh, that the state is interfering with religion in the very opposite thing. And mm -hmm. now, notice I'm saying religion, all not right. Christianity. That religion now is ruled out of any real impact in our, uh, uh, in our thinking. And the craziness of this shows itself uh, that from the very first, they had somebody pray in Congress. Congress isn't open until it's That's open correct. with prayer. That's correct. So they still could keep doing it. Mm -hmm. But you can't pray in public schools. Yes. How schizophrenic can you get? Well, it's the same thing with the Supreme Court, which says, God bless this noble court. I mean, it starts out that way, and yet they deny the privilege of little children to do what they do and, and to, pro to post the Ten Commandments, which they have on the walls of their court. And I would want to say with all finality that if the Founding Fathers could come back and see what's being made of that First Amendment, mm -hmm. they would consider it nothing less than tyranny. Well, let's go back to the concept of law. The, the, uh, if you have a Christian state, what is law? If you have a humanist state, what is law? Well, if you have a, a Christian state, or uh, let's not say a Christian state, but uh, a state that's founded on a Christian consensus. Mm -hmm. If you have this, you have a basis for law. And you must remember that what we have out of the Northern European culture of form and freedom, uh, of balances in government, these things are absolutely unique in the world. They were unique in history. Sometimes people say the Greek city-states have them. No real scholar believes this. What, what the Reformation produced was absolutely unique, in which there was real form, with, and yet the Christian consensus mm -hmm. kept that uh, kept the freedoms from pounding uh, the society to pieces because there's a law to base things on.
On the other hand, if you come in from the humanist side, uh, man is the measure of all things, and there's nothing to found it on. So that it's very interesting that these people move from denying the building of law upon the word of God mm -hmm. to denying any strict construction from the Constitution. They're absolutely, uh, they're he they're absolutely uh, free to make law what they want it to be. So, so the concept of, of law as existing apart, in a sense, from man, but coming from God and being a discovery of revelation of God, that's where we started. The, the, the idea of, of, of law is king, lex rex, that that, that is, the, is, the, is, the, is the king. And now we're substituting men's views, sociological interpretation for law. We switched it right over. Yeah. Uh, Samuel Rutherford, who means a great deal to me, uh, it wrote his, uh, wrote his uh, Lex Rex, law is king. And what he was saying is the king is not law. Mm -hmm. Now, what we've turned it is we flipped it right over from Oliver Wendell Holmes, all these people who brought in sociological law, mm -hmm. which means that law is made on what a few people think is for the sociological good of the, of the mm -hmm. uh, community at the moment. Uh, we flipped it right over, and now what we're returning to, people don't think of it this way, is Rex Lex, king is law. The only thing is we don't have a king. What we have is a Supreme Court, or we have 51% vote, or we have what uh, some the technocrats come forward and tell us uh, is for the good of society. So what we've done is flipped it right over uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, from Lex, Rex, Rex, now Rex, Lex. Well, you think the Supreme Court is, is the vehicle that the humanists are using or the court system to effectuate a radical change in society? Well, government as a whole, but especially the courts, and the, there's a reason for this. All the humanists and the, this type of thinker have used the courts rather than the legislatures mm -hmm. for the simple reason the courts are not subject to the will of the people through election or re-election. Consequently, all the great changes in the four, last 40 years has come through the, uh, through the courts. And what we must get in our mind is the government as a whole, but especially the courts, has become the vehicle mm -hmm. to force this view on the total population, even if the total population That's doesn't one. hold the view. We have a right to revolt against that. We're going to talk about that later in these discussions. But there comes a time that you have a, revolt, a right to revolt against tyranny, don't you? If you don't uh, revolt against tyranny, and the, this is what I call the bottom line, mm -hmm. is that not only do you have the privilege, but the duty to revolt when people force upon you and society that which is absolutely contrary to the Word of God mm -hmm. and which really is tyranny. So Samuel Rutherford was an amazing fellow, and what he pointed out quite properly is that God is never the author of tyranny. Therefore, wherever tyranny arises, we have a right to stand against it as a matter of principle. And this was the basis upon which the Founding Fathers built this country. Every 27 seconds in this country, a married couple unties the knot. Divorce is epidemic, even among professing Christians. Maybe your own marriage is in turmoil. Or maybe you're bored, disillusioned, or discouraged. Don't give up. Come to our Marriage Plus Seminar in Washington, D.C., October 22nd through 25th. As part of CBN's conference program, we have invited Reverend Ray Morseholder to share a message that has seen hundreds of divorces canceled and thousands of marriages made stronger. His insights into topics like these have opened doors wide for renewal. For more details, write Marriage Plus Seminar, Post Office Box 64065, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23464. The same God who hates divorce wants to heal your marriage and bind up your broken heart. Good morning, Sherry. Looks like we have a busy one today. Good morning, Mr. Nelson. Sure you can handle all that. Oh, it's nothing I can't wrestle down to size. <laughs> oh! Do you ever feel like you're in a wrestling match every business day? Terry, bring me the Krillman file now! Oh, thank you, Sherry. Uh, tell Frazier I'm all tied up. Mr. Frazier wants to meet with you now. Or do those unexpected meetings seem to get you down? Uh, oh. Mr. Nelson, can we meet now? Not now, Frazier. Are you being tossed and thrown from project to project? Sherry, tell Harv lunch is off. This report is killing me. How can you come to grips with those problems and decisions that you keep wrestling with? Call now and ask for your free copy of Wisdom from the Book. 
It offers practical advice on marriage, business, finances, and more. Dial 804-420-0700 and request your free copy of Wisdom from the Book. One of the leading Christian philosophers in the world is here with us, and we've been talking about the conflict developing in America, in Europe, and in other parts of the world between the forces of atheism, humanism, in some instances it comes out as communism or socialism, in other instances it comes out as what is called humanism or secular humanism, versus the Christian worldview, two apparently irreconcilable forces that are moving towards some point of a collision in the future. And it's a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Francis Schaefer. So once again, we welcome him from La Brie Fellowship in Switzerland. Again, God bless you. Dr. Schaefer, we've been talking about this matter of a humanistic uh, worldview and a human society. You mentioned a couple days ago that if we imposed humanism on our form of government, we'd have chaos. Have the humanists ever established a successful society anywhere? Well, it always runs like this. It's an absolute rule. Uh, and that is, first of all, their views, because they're relativistic and they have no base, always leads toward chaos, just what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. Now, society cannot stand chaos. I think that's because we're made in the image of God, mm -hmm. and that, whether, you were, whether we're Christian or not. And therefore, society never can stand chaos. So then there's always the next step, and we see it coming in this country, and the next step is always some form of authoritarian government to contain the chaos. So it always goes through the steps, uh, chaos leading to some form of authoritarian government. You can look back into the Roman Empire, see the rise of Caesar, Caesar Augustus, the worship of Caesar. You can look at the communist countries and their terrible oppression, like uh, the most recent thing in Poland. Uh, I wear my solidarity uh, pin, solidarity pin yeah. uh, sent to me by a lovely Christian girl just two days before the crackdown in Poland. She, and uh, I hope to wear it, incidentally, till she can wear it again. That's my hope. <laughs> But you see it in the communistic countries in their form, uh, but wherever you turn, uh, humanism, because it's relativistic, will always lead toward chaos, and the chaos will always bring in some form of totalitarian or authoritarian government. Well, in other words, you will see the same thing here, I guess, that if, if we continue, it, what you're saying is that, that humanism uh, cannot contain a society, and to have a self-governing people, they have to be motivated by an inner moral force that deals with, with a God-given natural law or God law that will control them from within. Uh, what, you, what you need is the realization, mm -hmm. uh, realization that there is a law giver. Yeah. Now, that's what our founding fathers built everything on, that there was a creator who was a lawgiver. So we write uh, certain inalienable rights. Right. Uh, this is meaningless if the state gives them, or if man gives them, because then he could take them away. Then they're not inalienable. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, the whole concept was that because there was a lawgiver, mm -hmm. we can have law, and a governmental law, or as we spoke a couple days ago, or yesterday, or whatever it was, uh, it can really be law is king. Right. simply because it's a lawgiver to give the law. Well, you have to also have some sort of a belief that e there is a, a future punishment for evil or a future reward for good. Doesn't that sort of tie in? Because otherwise, it's uh, um, uh, lex talionis or eat, drink, and be merry, uh, the, the, the philosophy of, of, of the Epicurean or whoever who says, that, Listen, tomorrow we die, so who cares? Let's, let's live it up for today. Yeah. This is right. We must see that on the materialistic side, uh, that it's absolutely neutral about cruelty or non-cruelty, the final reality would be this. In this case, therefore, uh, there is no absolute to judge anything by, whether it's personal relationships, personal actions, personal lifestyle, uh, or uh, government. In consequence, therefore, the word guilt becomes stupid and meaningly, meaningless and nonsense mm -hmm. if you do not have an absolute to set these things. Now, of course, after that, there comes the other side of it, and that is if there is such a God who is there, and he has a character, and not all things are the same to him, which is the Judeo-Christian God, not the Eastern gods. Uh, but if there is such a one, then when the law is broken, there is real moral guilt, mm -hmm. and there will be punishment. So then, of course, we have the coming of Christ and his dying on the cross to take the punishment. On the other hand, uh, we must realize uh, that this God is going to judge. So therefore, it, first of all, before God, there is real guilt. But secondly, there is guilt also before 
law. Mm -hmm. But all you have to do is look at our own country and realize the whole concept of guilt is going. What we have is. is everybody's just sick, nobody's guilty for anything, and nobody feels responsibility. And Young had taught, if it feels good, do it, which is a hedonistic type of creed, uh, whatever is, in, and that is taught by humanism. If, if, it, if it satisfies you, then do it. Of course, and it, that's true in sexual things, but it's not only in sexual things. This is only the most visible. It's in the totality of life. Well, now, uh, let's go back in history and also uh, in fairly recent history. Uh, the French Revolution had, a, had, a, had a, uh, apparently the crowning of a goddess of reason in one of the Christian churches, Notre Dame, I guess, uh, and then following this expression, this explosion of revolutionary zeal, there was a dictator. Dictatorship, uh, first the terror, then finally Napoleon. Is, is that... Uh... Absolutely so. Uh, occasionally people try to parallel the French Revolution and the American Revolution. They've ha they just haven't... Uh, they're either dishonest or they haven't read their history. The American Revolution was faced, uh, based upon the concept that there was a lawgiver who could give the law. The French Revolution was based on the Enlightenment and man as the center of all things. It led quickly to the rule of terror in which even the leaders of the revolution were guillotined. The society fell apart so quickly that the French people uh, took their form of authoritarianism with great joy, and that was Napoleon and his rule. Well, was, was Nazi Germany a continuation? Would you call that humanistic, or what, what would you identify Adolf Hitler as? Well, absolutely. They ha you had, have a materialistic view, and uh, therefore society, and this brings us to abortion, which is so crucial in all this, uh, therefore human life had no intrinsic value, and uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the elite, in that case uh, Hitler and his, fa his uh, little group, uh, would be able to kill whoever they wish to kill for the good of society. And we've opened the door, humanism has opened the door to that same thing in our country, in abortion and infanticide and all that it leads to. Have you ever read the Constitution? Do you know the principles it contains? If someone changed it, would you even know the difference? Many Americans are strangely unaware or have forgotten about our heritage which gave birth to our form of government. Now you have an opportunity to gain a new appreciation for the genius of our Constitution. The National Legal Foundation wants to send you a free copy of the written Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Simply write, The National Legal Foundation, P.O. Box 64845, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23464. Begin now to learn more about our priceless heritage. What better way to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Constitution than by reading it and understanding what it says? Let's prevent it and America from becoming ancient history. Send for yours today. CBN University graduate Marjorie Cole talks about her work. If Christians don't get out and make a difference in society, nobody will. One of our greatest concerns is the state funding of abortion. CBN University was able to give me the scriptural foundations to do what I believe is right in my heart. For information about CBN University's graduate master's degree programs, call 1-800-952-8000. Once again, this has been so informative and so interesting. I'm interested in, in action, and I, I think you've said and others have said we have sort of a window of time, a window of opportunity with uh, uh, a particularly favorable Senate and a president who shares basically our concept of the way the world is. How do we avoid, as Christians, getting enmeshed in what would be called reactionary republicanism or liberal democratic programs and missing what God has? Is there an alternate, a, a different way from either of these two? Yes, we have to understand what the enemy is. The enemy is this other view of reality, that reality, final reality, is only material or energy shaped by pure chance. Mm -hmm. Now then, uh, and humanism coming built on that, uh, that man is the center of all things. Now what we must fix in our mind as Christians, if we're going to get anywhere in all this, is that a conservative humanism mm -hmm. is no better than a liberal humanism. <laughs> and we've just got to get down, down there and not vote by labels. 
Now, when we come to this, we must then say, indeed, through the conservative swing of the last election, mm -hmm. the 1980 election in the United States, uh, that we do have an open door that we haven't had for some years. But we also must say we must see results from that. Mm -hmm. We mustn't just settle for mere words. And with all economic pressure, indeed, on uh, this administration, and there must be an improvement in the economy and the defense, and we must stand against the imperialistic Russian thrust. Yet, nevertheless, if these issues such as abortion are not dealt with, uh, and we just let words, words, words come forth instead of action, the whole battle's going to be lost. You kind of go back a few years ago when the Christian uh, consensus pretty much governed this nation. How did we lose it? Well, what has been wrong with evangelicals even up to the present day that keeps them from getting involved in, in, in any kind of thing like this? I think a false view of spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, a platonic view of spirituality which follows Plato, the philosopher Plato, Greek philosopher, but certainly isn't biblical. Mm -hmm. And that is that spirituality is shut up to a small area of life. Uh, or you can say that the soul is important, the body isn't important, would be a, a quick fix on the thing. Well, we, what we must realize is that in this view, in this view, everything is worldly that isn't in this little box of spirituality. Mm -hmm. Now, as I look at the Bible, this is exactly 1,000% backwards. There are certain sinful things that the God tells us are sinful, and we ought to take those and set them aside. And then we must acknowledge we're sinners too. None of us are perfect. But nevertheless, we should set them aside. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is spiritual. Well, elaborate on that. Everything then in the world, because you're saying that Jesus has a plan and a worldview and a purpose. He's not just God of the church. He's God of everything. Absolutely. He made it. Yeah. And one day, uh, the wonder is, Jesus is coming back, and there's going to be the redemption of all things, as Peter said immediately after Jesus' ascension. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to be raised from the dead. Paul emphasizes that in 1 Corinthians 15. If we're not going to be raised from the dead, uh, Christianity is a total failure. Uh, it means nothing. Uh, God is interested in the totality of life, art, music, literature, but also the political life. So true spirituality means the lordship of Christ in the totality of life and not just a small part of it. The liberal press particularly would try to keep conservative Christians, if you will, or evangelicals out of political life, and there's this great pressure to make fun of you when you get, quote, in politics. And they, they, want to, they, they don't think it should be, and there are many Christians who, who say yes to the same thing. Now, what do you say to them? Well, they're wrong. Okay, <laughs> that's that's so sad. But what Christians should should do? What run for office, vote, register, get involved? What what ought they to do? Well, we ought to realize that in the a viewpoint of the Scripture, uh, life is not divided up into watertight compartments. Uh, that all of life should be lived for the Lordship of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, what exact uh, portion each one of us should have? Uh, is according to the Lord's leading for us. So we cannot lay down rules for, for people. They must look to the Lord directly to know. But the principle to lay down, uh, yes, the rule to lay down, is that Christians have a responsibility for the society in which they live. We're to be the salt. We're to be the light. And I would say this with absolute firmness. We are not in the mess we're in in this country and throughout the world. Uh, especially think of the Reformation countries, and spe uh, specifically the United States, we're not in the mess we're in because of a humanist conspiracy. I think there is a humanist conspiracy. Mm -hmm. That's not the reason we're in trouble. The reason we're in trouble is the church has not really followed out the concept of the Lordship of Christ and the totality of life in these last 80, 40 years. And that being so, by our silence, by refusing to be what God tells us to be, the light of this culture, uh, and so on, uh, the salt of the culture. We are the ones responsible before God for the mess we're in. Well, now, in past revivals, Wesley, for example, or maybe the uh, move in the 1850s with uh, Moody and Finney and these great men, did that result in some kind of social action? I sometimes wonder if our evangelical leadership uh, remembers our heritage.
Mm -hmm. uh, it is true that the Great Awakening prior to the uh, founding of America, the Wesley Revival, the Whitfield Revival, the re Great Revivals in Scandinavia, they called for the salvation of individual souls and thousands were saved. We should be mm -hmm. so thankful. But there wasn't a single one of those that did not result in social consciousness and social action. And the Wall Street Journal, as I quote in the Christian Manifesto, uh, pointed out that it was the Great Awakening uh, in America, that revival, that led to the preparation for the founding of this country. Now that's what we've forgotten. And our institutions all, in a sense, flow out of revival, and we must be in a salted light to, keep, to, to preserve them, to keep them going. If we don't, we, we fail them. That's right, and as Christians, we yeah. need constant revival, of course, and the church needs constant revival. Uh, but I would always uh, say, here's Reformation and revival. They should never be put contrary to each other. Reformation is the restoration of pure doctrine. It should always lead to the restoration of the individual Christian's life and revival. Uh, but it flows the other way. Re So-called revival and all kinds of talk about the work of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that does not lead to the Lordship of Christ and the totality of life, including social action. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong along the way. Professor Rice said it's war between the Christians and the humanists, but he said, I think we're going to win. You want to give your prognosis of how it'll come out? You know, people always say to me, you're an optimist or a pessimist. And I'm an optimist in the sense that I believe in the United States we have the greatest opportunity in the world, maybe the only opportunity at this moment, to turn it around. In that sense, I'm an optimist. If you ask me, though, whether we're going to, it depends upon the Christians whether they're really to pay the price in their own professions, mm -hmm. whether the way to pay the price for Christ, to stand on the cutting edge, it means the nurse being fired because she refuses to let the little baby starve to death that the doctor says should starve to death in a fantasy. Mm -hmm. It means the lawyer. Uh, he, he shouldn't be a Christian lawyer just by putting the Moody Monthly or something on his reading table or the Christian magazines instead of secular ones. He ought to be out there fighting these First Amendment cases, mm -hmm. fighting for freedom in, for the, so that the uh, humanist state doesn't reach down into the Christian schools uh, with uh, an, a uh, forcing... Uh, a twist to the Christian curriculum, uh, so molding it again to their humanist views. He ought to be in there fighting in all these areas. Uh, the doctor ought to be willing uh, not to have that position as an obstetrician, a gynecologist in one of the great hospitals if, uh, if he refuses to uh, uh, perform abortions. You ought to pay the price for it. And most of all, maybe the pastors better get busy and pay the price of being willing to upset their people who sit there in the pew Sunday after Sunday and they love the music and they love to say, isn't it wonderful? Yeah. And all the time they're going through this whole thing, they move out after Sunday and do nothing into the culture that costs them anything. Sometimes it's almost more than you can take. There doesn't seem to be any way out. Perhaps your marriage is in trouble or you have financial obligations far beyond your ability to pay. Maybe you're devastated by an unwanted pregnancy or an addiction to drugs or alcohol. Whatever your situation, no matter how desperate you may feel, you can overcome through prayer. The 700 Club wants you to know you can receive answers to your prayers. Miracles happen. Lives are changed through prayer. We know because we see it happen every day. Call the 700 Club prayer line, 1-804-420-0700. There are people here to pray with you, people who know and understand the power of prayer, people who have seen God do the impossible and who know he'll do it again and again. Don't put it off. Call right now for the power of prayer to work in your life. We're told to obey the civil authorities. The Christians were told by Paul to obey those in authority, and yet they wouldn't obey that point which said you must worship the emperor as God. What about us today? Well, we must realize that the humanist that we've been talking about, the one holding the materialistic view of uh, final reality, those who hold this view, and that's most of the youngsters now down into the universities, mm -hmm. they have no reason for obeying the state except the state has the guns, Mm -hmm. and they can give out uh, things to the people. That's all. Mm 
uh, they have no reason any more than they have for sexual values or any other values. The Christian, on the other hand, is told to obey the state. So we have a reason for obeying the state. And the state is one of the offices given by God to restrain this fallen, abnormal world from going to chaos. But, now we come strongly to the but, but that does not mean that God has set up an autonomous authority, autonomous to himself and his commands. It is not as though the government is the one place <clears throat> where man is meant to be the measure of all things. Now this meant in the early church, just what we just saw, mm -hmm. uh, that when Caesar command, said he was to be worshipped, you must realize from the Christian's viewpoint it was religious. From the state's viewpoint it had nothing to do with religion at all. You could be an atheist, you could worship anything. Uh, Zoroastrianism, anything. They didn't care. It had nothing to do with religion. It was purely civil. So when those Christians said we refuse to worship Caesar and they were thrown into the Roman arena, they were in civil disobedience, they were the rebels. Now, we have to get that into our mind. The same thing is true when we come to the Reformation. There was no place where the Reformation was successful without some form of civil disobedience and often uh, something stronger. Uh, consequently, we, come, we must face the question. The bottom line, that I believe the bottom line is simply this, and that is that there comes a place where the state, whether it's a communistic state or our own state, no matter what it is, the state commands that which is contrary to the law of God. The Christian not only has the privilege, he has the absolute duty to disobey the state. And if we do not face that bottom line, we must recognize where we are. We have said, contrary to what the early Christians said, we have said that the state is God. In other words, there's no middle ground on this one. Mm -hmm. None whatsoever. Either the state is going to be made God, a false God, but God, mm -hmm. and we're going to obey it no matter what, or we must face the factor uh, that there are certain places we come to where the state must be disobeyed. Well, now, back to the revolution. Our uh, forefathers had a, a not too arbitrary king. He was claimed to be a madman, but he wasn't as near as bad as communists are today, mm -hmm. uh, King George. And there were was a parliament, and parliament put some taxes on the people. They weren't terribly burdensome taxes. There were stamp taxes on certain exports and imports and so forth. Nothing uh, we would consider in relation to our current internal revenue tax. It wasn't even, a, it was a fraction of what we have to pay now. And yet, they decided that that was cause enough to rebel, or to have a revolution. Now, and they, of course, they quartered troops, they did other things that were obnoxious to the people. What we must realize is, just as the Wall Street Journal that I quoted before pointed out, uh, that it was the Great Awakening that re got people ready for this. And as I stress and uh, document very carefully in the book, The Christian Manifesto, uh, the Christian clergy had a great deal to do with all this. And no greater name uh, than uh, Witherspoon. Uh, Witherspoon was a great hero of mine. He's president of what is now, uh, now Princeton University. And uh, he was the only signer of the Declaration of Independence. And he followed directly after Samuel Rutherford in his writing, uh, Lex Rex. And whether you held the view that Witherspoon did, or even those who weren't Christian individually, nevertheless, they all saw... Uh, they all had the view that when you came to tyranny, mm -hmm. that you had to oppose it. And the Christians, the Christian clergy, the really the real Bible-believing Christians, not the deists, no. The real Bible-believing Christians were very much rooted back into that concept where the early church stood. And that is that as Christians, they had a responsibility to stand against what they saw as tyranny. And they had a, it was back into Samuel Rutherford again, and then behind that into John Knox. And that is that all tyranny comes from the devil and not from God, because God wants free, people to be free and not to be held with any form of tyranny. Now, you mentioned about our present laws, our present taxes, and so forth. What we're facing in this country today is far beyond what they, they were facing. Oh, absolutely. And if they thought they had to stand against tyranny, we better stand against tyranny. And we have tyranny. We have a hidden censorship. Uh, we showed this from whatever happened to the human race. Uh, it's technically a good film. Yes. Everybody acknowledges this. So we offered it to public television.
But the woman who saw it, the director in Washington, as soon as she heard it was against abortion, she said, we can't show this because we can only show things on shows both sides. So she wouldn't even look at it. But simultaneously, they were showing this abominable hard choices, which is sheer propaganda oh. in favor of abortion. Mm -hmm. Public television, I think, is a clear viewpoint, a clear illustration of a hidden censorship. You have Cosmos, uh, you have Bernowski's The Ascent of Man, you have Clark's Civilization, you have a new series coming on right now at this present time on the evolution. All these things carried along with public tax money. But we cannot get our things on. Mm -hmm. You have to pay for your time. Oh, absolutely we pay for it. And something like whatever happened to the human race is uh, absolutely has no place. Well, what about Dr. Coop? You speak of, of, of censorship. Uh, he was one of your dear friends. Tell us about him. It's a clear illustration. Uh, the, news, the liberal newspapers dominated by this humanist view, uh, they carried reams of material trying to get poor old uh, Dr. Coop uh, who has been my friend for 30 years, uh, trying to get him not to be uh, accepted as the Surgeon General of the United States. Mm -hmm. When he was accepted, the Washington Post ran, as I remember, one inch on the third page. So awful. Well, now his qualifications, he was, had been uh, given an award by the French government for his work in pediatrics. He's one of the most eminent pediatricians in the United States or in the world, I suppose. He has developed more, uh, more operational procedures for small babies for preemies than any man in the world. And he also has had experience in the direction of what would be the care of public health. And this was a pure, just as we were shut off, uh, with whatever happened to the human race, he was shut off, not because he didn't have the qualifications, but because he stood for human life and the value of human life, mm -hmm. and behind it, the Christian view instead of the humanist. And, and so the, the secular media motor mobilized itself in this campaign to destroy him and did not allow his good points to be brought out. Either. Yeah, and I, uh, we must say something very carefully now if we're yeah. going to really have any chance on this battle. It doesn't mean there are six people meet together in a smoke-filled room and have, uh, have a plot. Yeah. The, if you hold the worldview of materialism uh, and you're in the media, and not all the media has this, but if you're in the media or you're in government or you're in, in education, mm -hmm. you don't have to get together and have a plot because your worldview is going to, with absolute inevitability, bring forth a simultaneous action together at the particular issue. Sure. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd be the same way. You've got to be fair. I, I don't want to give great uh, amounts of air time to professed atheists and humanists who'd want to destroy the Christian worldview, and I, I guess they'd be the same way in relation to us. Yeah, but you're a bit different. You're, you pay for your time. Yes. Uh, the newspapers are supposed to make a distinction between news and the editorial page. Mm -hmm. If they want to be against us on the editorial page, that's their privilege, and it's our privilege not to buy the newspaper. Right. But when they begin to get into this sort of thing and have a hidden censorship on the news pages, mm -hmm. that is tyranny. Well, not only that, of course, the government itself is paying enormous amounts of money to uh, organizations like Planned Planned Parenthood to give out who give out pro-abortion literature and help uh, foster abortion. Any number of liberal organizations have been funded to uh, in some of multi millions, hundreds of millions of dollars out of taxpayers' money. That's right, and Planned Parenthood's a perfect example. They're, they've get, gotten all kinds of money out of the government, and yet all you have to do is pick up the newspaper ads that they're running now in favor of abortion mm -hmm. to understand that they, they're only a propaganda agency. And the founder of it uh, 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 was always opposed to abortion. And they've changed completely over. And what you have is the realization that tax money goes to these people uh, that are propaganda agencies. And we're shut out. Well, again, you can look at the at the the woman's uh, uh, year situation where they had that woman's rally in uh, in Texas. Only those who were essentially anti-Christian were invited to it, and it was there was five million dollars of public money. Whereas the Christians had a much larger rally, totally ignored. And you can you, this kind of thing has been in our recent history, time and time and time again. Yeah, and we must get some, get this fixes another thought in our mind. Humanism, mater this materialist view. Uh, intrinsically is oppressive and it's exclusive and the proof of it is the public schools they take over the public schools and they will not allow the civil liberties union lawyers and the other people will not allow another voice 
and they absolutely used a perverted use a perverted view of the First Amendment in order. Now, this one really should bring us up short. The schools in the United States today are as secularized, they aren't Marxist, but they're as secularized as the schools in Russia. The schools in Russia allow only the materialistic view to be taught. Mm -hmm. But there is no, but in the United States, the public schools today, paid for by the parents' tax money, right. are as exclusively teaching the materialistic view as are the schools in Russia. And even if the parents, as in Arkansas and Louisiana and these other places, even if the parents don't want it taught, mm -hmm. the courts are the vehicle to say, you children have to be taught exclusively the materialistic view, whether you like it or not. Well, that, of course, is, is uh, oppressive. It is tyrannical. It's exactly what Thomas Jefferson spoke against. Now, what do we do? The window, in a sense, may be open, but the tyranny is coming down. What should Christians do? And this is happening. We must operate on what... Sammy Rutherford would have called the appropriate level. You don't start from the top and uh, use the biggest thing. You start where you can. We are fortunate to be one of the very few countries left in the 150-some countries in the world that have freedom. We should use every political means. That means electing people who, do, uh, who uh, will uh, carry out these views and at least be for freedom. That's all we ask. We don't ask that our view would have preeminence. We're asking for freedom, the very thing our founding fathers were willing to die for. Then we ought to carry on. And if uh, and in the courts, we ought to have a good Christian lawyers like John Whitehead and so on, carry these things right up into the Supreme Court and challenge all these things because they're quite opposed, really, to the uh, to legal to the legal Absolutely. continuity out of the past. Then beyond that, uh, we must be willing to disobey. And it's up to the individual Christian. Nobody else should tell another person. But there would be a place to stop paying your t part of your taxes uh, in these areas uh, because of these areas. There would also be a place to pick it. Mm -hmm. There is a place to do all these things. There's a place, perhaps, to be, have a sitting in the Supreme Court. In other words, we should work on the appropriate level. But using the freedoms we have, we're not carrying out either our God-given command mm -hmm. nor even the what our founding fathers would have considered the proper attitude toward tyranny we're not carrying out either one unless we use the appropriate means at the present time to reverse the direction we're going in